Welcome to Dumb Fight Fans. To the Fighters Boys Kick Ass Podcast. Your Black Talk Authority. Not to mention the most entertaining and talked about podcast with your kick ass host, Richard Ortiz. You mad? Come at me, bro. Streaming live and worldwide. Coming to you all the way live from a little place somewhere in Cali. The Fighters Boys Kick Ass Podcast. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Richard Ortiz of the Fighter's Voice Kick-Ass Podcast, episode number two. With us today, we have with us the president, CEO of Gold Sticker Public Relations, the one, the only, the woman behind boxing, the face of women's boxing behind the scenes, making everybody's dream come true, including her own. Enough said, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show, Julie. Julie Gold Sticker. Thank you so much. I love that intro. I will take it. I will take it. There you go. You also like the little uh, clip we put together. I remember you said you liked that. I did. I had to put I that did. music yes. together. Very fun. And that was a no-brainer. Yes. That music, it, it just, it was a good blend, I thought. Yes, I agree. It was very fun. I, anything uplifting always works for me. There you go. Exactly. Julie, a lot of people see you in Las Vegas. They see you with the headliners, the pay-per-view names. Everybody sees you. You're in pictures. You're, you're on TV. But a lot of boxing fans, they really don't know exactly what your job consists of. And I believe you've been in the boxing scene since 2009, correct? Uh, professional boxing since 2009. I started working for USA Boxing. So I got my start on the amateur side. I started working for USA Boxing in 2001. So I am 22 uh, years into the sport of boxing, doing all kinds of different things. I am um, by title a publicist. So um, I spent 15 years at USA Boxing as the director of public relations, uh, went to four Olympic games. So that's where my roots are. And that's why you'll see that I know a lot of, uh, a lot of fighters, even fighters that I don't work with. And that's because I saw so many of them come up through the amateur ranks, either on national teams, Olympic teams, juniors. Um, so I get, I've gotten to see the whole progression um, of, of so many athletes. Uh, so as, as in the professional ranks, I moved, um, I was doing both from 2009 till 2016. And then, um, and that's when I started my, my business, um, Gold Sticker Public Relations. I was working um, at that time with uh, Andre Berto and Andre Ward and Berto told me, that if he wants me to, if I want him to pay me, then I need to start my own business. So he was my uh, motivation to start my own business at that time, which I did. Um, and currently, so I do everything from setting up interviews to overseeing athlete schedules to sometimes I'm in an assistant role. I do something a little bit different for a lot of the athletes that I work with. Um, and then when it comes to fight week, I'm handling their schedules, their tickets, their credentials. Sometimes oh, wow. it's merch, um, all the behind the scenes stuff, um, running their fight week to make sure that we have the right mix of interviews and promotional requirements, but also give them a chance to train and cut weight and, and get ready for fight night. Wow. What, what's your roster like today? <laughs> it, it changes. So um, uh, Terrence Crawford, um, working with Andre Ward as a retired athlete, Shakur Stevenson. Um, this week, I'm uh, getting ready for Jesus Ramos' fight next week on the undercard of uh, Canelo Charlo. That's Kenneth huge. Sims just started working um, with Freddie Rojas. And with some athletes, I'll do a fight to fight because not all athletes can afford to or justify having a publicist on their payroll throughout the year. Um, right. And some athletes, I'm on a, um, a year round situation. Wow. I mean, talk about you got a Hall of Famer uh, on on your belt and you got one that's going to be a first ballot and one potential Hall of Famer. You got the cream of the crop. Yes, I've, I've been very fortunate to work with the best of the best. And, you know, I think that they prepare me for each other. You know, I I feel like working with Andre really prepared me to work with Terrence um, and just knowing kind of how they operate and finding the right um, mix and knowing how to, how, I'm not going to say how to deal with them, but how to um, build the best relationships with my athletes right. because I have access to those times when, you know, they're in training camp, they're in fight week, and, you know, you have to really have people that you trust in those moments. So 
that's something that I work really hard to build with my athletes. Yeah. And talk about fight week. You know, you also got to be sensitive to their, their, I don't want to say outbursts, but they're going through a lot. They're cutting weight. They're, they're missing their families. Uh, they're, you know, sometimes they become agitated, you know, but they have duties yeah. to do. And I, I guess you're the one that just calms the storm and keeps their perspective focus on, on fight week and their opponent. I try to, you know, and I also try to be understanding and sensitive that, yeah, they're dealing with cutting weight. They're dealing with the biggest moment of their lives. So there's pressure. And, you know, so I try to be sensitive to that. You're going to have moments where people are short. Um, but I have learned to be very thick skin and to just know that, you know, what my role is. And we're all there to support the fighter. We're all there so that when they step into that ring on fight night, that's all that they're focused on. So that's what I try to do. Um, it's not always easy. And a lot of times people feel like, oh, just get them to do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, you're one of 10 people asking me to get them to do just this one thing. So, you know, know knowing um, how to manage those things. But, you know, this last one with, with um, Crawford Spence was definitely a new challenge for me. Um, was what not made, what made it easy. different? And I, I, what made it different? What made it challenging? I think the magnitude, you know, I've, I've, I worked with Andre Berto when he fought Floyd. So I had that fight. Andre Ward obviously had massive fights, two Kovalev fights, pay-per-view fights. Um, the significance of this fight in general was, was huge. And, you know, finding the right balance of him promoting the fight in the right way. Um, and contrary to popular belief, Terrence is a good interview. <laughs> um, you know, finding the right interviews for him to do because they only have so much time, you know, and yeah. so you want to be cognizant and, and figure out kind of how to manage those things. Um, who was coming into camp because, you know, a lot of media outlets want to come into camp and who you're giving those type of access to. So, um, you know, because the fighters trust you to look at those things and, and identify what's best for them to do. Um, you're not going to, you don't want to go to a Terrence Crawford when he's in camp with 87 different, um, you know, opportunities. You want to really be able to sort those for him and, and come to him with what, makes the most sense and, you know, will have the most impact. When that time comes, what's the most difficult thing uh, about your job? The selecting or is it, you know, like you said, the, the thick skin or being able to adapt to their moods? I think um, a, a little bit of all of it, you know, for this last fight, I think, you know, I definitely felt the pressure to, to do a good job for him and to find the right outlets and to know what, um, what to take to him. And, you know, Terrence is someone who will hear you out. You know, if he gives you a no, then obviously I have to respect it. I joke that there's different versions of Terrence no's, you know, there's the, the hard no that you're like, okay, I, I got it. I'm, you know, I'll never mention it yeah. again. Um, and then a soft no, um, that you're like, let me, let me reposition this and see if you feel like it, <laughs> it makes sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, and having to bother them, you know, I, I'm the person you know, I, I'm very good friends with the the ladies from Perfecting Athletes, and we joke that you know they come in and they bring them food and they they you know take care of them, and I have to come in and ask them to do things and wake them up and tell you know we've got to do these 17 interviews now, and I know the fight's four days away, but I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so it's sometimes difficult. I think that's where your relationship with the fighter comes in. Yeah. Um, I've been working with Terrence since 2017, so he and I have a good rhythm he does camp out here in Colorado. So I'm able to be in camp with him multiple days a week. And it's helpful to just go sit down with him and be like, this is what we have coming up and just kind of talk um, through it with him in person. But, you know, I feel like everything that I've done prepares me for that next moment. So all of the fights that I'd worked prior to Crawford Spence kind of helped me prepare um, for that, that huge fight. Colorado Denver fan, correct? I'm in Denver, yeah. There you go, John Allen. I I'm, I grew up in Dallas. I grew up in Dallas. Now I'm a Cowboys so fan, a so we'll Cowboys take you. Maverick. Yes, yep. I grew up in Dallas, so I maintain my um, my Dallas sports roots. I went to Texas, so I'm a Longhorn, but I have got swept. I have gotten swept up in in Dion mania for sure. So I'm enjoying seeing what the oh, what the Buffs are doing in Boulder right now. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to selecting your clients, is it safe to call them your clients at this time? Uh, yeah. What do you look for? And, and when do you say no? When do you back off? I haven't, it's, it's rare for me to say no. You know, I'm fortunate that some of them come to me and, 
you know, it's been interesting because I've now been gone from USA Boxing for t- since 2016. So this group of athletes that's turning professional now is really the first group of athletes that I don't know or have contact with. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it's through, you know, shared trainers. So, you know, the folks at B&B bring people to me. Coach K brings people to me. Um, you know, the Ramoses came to me through Jamie Bell. Um, so, you know, generally they, they come to me and, and it's very rare for me to say, no, I don't want to work with you. There would have to really be, um, I can't think of what it would be to be honest, but you know, I've been very fortunate to work with some really great kids and, and teams. And, you know, it's helpful if you have a relationship with the whole team, because, you know, it, it's gotta be a group effort, um, to know when they're training, to know when to schedule interviews and all that good stuff. I guess there, there's um, ones that become more than clients, become, I guess you, you would call them uh, brothers or, or family. Uh, you can't help right. but get close and be sensitive, you know, if they do take an L or they receive bad news. And, uh, you know, the, the, the life of a boxer, a lot of people think he just walks into the ring, he's a fighter, maintained a, a fighter all the time. They don't know that he goes through um, personal, uh, maybe divorce, uh, money, or buying a new car, uh, missing, taking his kids to Disneyland, all the above, you know, he is a human being. A lot of people just see the limelight. For sure. And and I definitely try to build relationships with the athletes, families, um, you know, the athletes, significant others, I'm spending a lot of time with their, um, their husbands. And so it's important to me to build relationships with everybody that's in their life. Um, you know, team Crawford is a family. That's just, they adopt you. That's just, how they are, you know, I've worked with Shakur Stevenson since he was 15. So I joke that that's the closest thing I have to a child. Um, so, you know, I have his mother and I are six months apart in age. <laughs> um, so, you know, he's like a son slash little brother to me and I'm involved in every area of his, you know, of Shakur's life, um, was there when he lost at the Olympics and was sobbing his eyeballs out. Um, all that stuff is really, really difficult. And it's, I think that it's important for anybody who works with a fighter to really understand what their life looks like, because it's not easy by any way, shape or form. And for a lot of them going into the gym is a sanctuary and they get to kind of shut everything else out. Um, But they all have super difficult things going on in their lives from time to time. And you have to, um, you have to be sensitive to that. You have to build a relationship where they can talk to you about it. um, So you know when to pull back and when to push. I joke that my least favorite part of fight week is the actual fight. Um, that really? really is my least favorite part because it's so nerve wracking. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it's super, super nerve wracking. And, you know, especially the bigger the fight is. Um, How calm are you when and you're I can't in your seat? Are, are you moving around? Are you screaming? Are you like, get him, butter? No, no, no. I mean, are you one of those? Because I'm, I'm sure you feel it just like they do because you're so close to them. Sure. It depends. It's funny. My dad used to watch for me and he would say I had my like fight face, which was like this. And I would say I'm looking at my knees or I'm looking at my phone a good chunk of time. Um, In the last several years, I've more been in the press section. So it's, you know, I try not to, I try to follow the rules and not, you know, I am moving a little bit. Um, When Shakur fought Oscar Valdez, I was, uh, I, I started moving. I think the, it was a combination of the engagement ring in my pocket and the Valdez fans that were making everything seem feel closer than it, it truthfully was. Um, So I did some pacing. I didn't stay in my seat for that long in the Valdez fight, but majority of them, even if I'm not watching, um, I'm usually in my seat. It's just, I try not to, not to say I try not to watch, but I end up not watching because it's too much sometimes. How many times a year do you stay home? Are you on the road longer than you are at home? It depends on the year. So, and it, it's interesting. So like when Terrence was in camp, he's in Colorado Springs, which is a little over an hour from me. So I was there a ton. Um, it really depends on the year and what, and what is going on. You know, I would say probably half and half. I love being home when I'm home. I definitely have a new appreciation um, for being home. You know, after Terrence's parade on the 12th, I was home for two weeks and it was, you know, it's been very exciting to be here. And I, I have a different appreciation of like routine of yeah. like when I go to the gym and my, my Zumba class that I can now make. And, um, 
but I like to travel. I don't like the process of traveling anymore. Flying is a pain. It used to be more fun. Um, but I do like to be in other places and I kind of have a rhythm um, when I'm on those other places. It, it, it is a pain. Even if you're late for your flight, they don't care. They don't care. They're just, they're moving slow. They're talking. And I'm like, come on, we got to go. I've missed several flights before. So believe me, it's not as fun yeah. as it used to be. I, I get that. It is not at all. No. Yes. I'm my father's daughter, so I'm usually early. Okay. Um, I can't take the anxiety of whether or not I'm going to make it. But yeah, it's a pain. Um, but there's no other way to get there. So do what you got to do. Now, when when fighters aren't fighting, when they don't have a fight that's signed, how much do you communicate with them? Is it on a personal level, has nothing to do with boxing, or is it still, okay, right. uh, don't forget we have this. Do you, do you continue to remind them of things, or do you just give them a call just to see how they're doing? How's that relationship? Yeah, it depends. So Shakur I'm in touch with at least weekly. Um, that's just because I'm involved in everything that that he does, and he's a funny little human. So um, I talk to Shakur at least weekly, if not every other day or so. Um, Andre, I usually talk to pretty often. Terrence kind of, I let Terrence kind of be in between fights. So we've spoken often since this fight, because there's obviously a lot going on. Yeah. And then I would say, you know, I would try to every month or so, at least to check in and see what's going on or like what's coming up or, you know, for like a Kenny Sims, it's, you know, What's going on? Do we have a date? What's going on with this title shot? I'm just trying to stay updated on what's going on with them. You know, or if they had a baby, what's going on with, you know, his fiance and the kids. So I do try to check in. When you're not um, preparing your, your client for a, a fight, when you're not out there during fight week, what does Julie do on her free time? What do you do on your free time? I mean, real time, not just two weeks. What, what do you like to do? I like to walk. I'm a big walker. I like to walk and listen to bad Bravo podcasts. Okay. Um, well, we, well, we now a got a new junkie, podcast so for you great. to listen to. So we'll make sure you listen and tune into the fighter's voice. So you can add that. To you. There, there you, you go. go. Yes, we can add that. Um, yeah. So I, you know, we've got great weather out here, so I love to go out and walk outside and just kind of, you know, zone out and listen to something that doesn't matter. Um, like to do Zumba, love to watch, housewives um love football so i'm excited for football season yeah, to get back too. um if i can get home to dallas and see my family or connect with them um love to do that what else those are really the biggest i'm a coffee junkie as i told you so um love to get my coffee in the morning and i like to read when i have downtime for sure what, where do you buy your coffee at what's your favorite coffee so i'm a starbucks girl but i have um Andre gifted me with an espresso. Okay. So I have been better um, about making my morning coffee at home. Um, so I have my Nespresso pods that I use, but I do love to go sit at Starbucks and read or um, work from there because I work from home. So um, it's nice if I'm home for a while to, to just go sit in a Starbucks and, and people and watch. Now there's pumpkin stuff. Do you back. people watch? Yes. Yeah, I love to people watch. I do too. Like you can't beat it. No, you can't. Yes. No, it's very fun. You, you can't. I like going to the mall and you'll see a couple walk into the mall. And sometimes when I'm sitting down, I'll see that couple leave. Now, if I see the husband with more bags than his wife, oh, I know he's in for it. Or if he's holding bags and she's not, I'm thinking to myself, oh, he's in for it. It's very fun to create stories when you see people of what, you know, you think their, their situation yeah. is what their relationship is, where they're coming from, um, you know, to use your imagination for sure. Right. If you were not a, a publicist in sports, what other profession would you be involved in? Um, I think potentially psychology. My mom is a, is a counselor. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a sideline reporter. I wanted to be like Hannah Storm. Oh, really? Um, that's where I kind of, I always knew I wanted to work in sports. Um, and that's what I thought I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a sideline reporter, went to Texas, got my degree in journalism. Nice. And right before I was about to graduate, I took a sports psychology class and I like, it made me rethink my whole path. Um, so I think that would be interesting, but I really, the thing that I love the most is, is telling stories and, you know, learning about people. And I think that's one thing that's so amazing about sports and what I try to do, you know, with all of my athletes is to tell their stories because I think 
you know, I, I said, I love to read. I only like to read biographies because I think people's stories are better than anything I agree. That we can come up with. Um, so I consider myself above all else, a storyteller. Or that's what I try to be. Um, so I think something in that, in that vein somewhere. Favorite food. What's your favorite food? French fries. Just French fries. I like French fries. Yeah. I love French fries, pure French fries. Don't put cheese and chili and no, I want French fries maybe with ranch, but either French fries with ketchup or French fries with ranch for sure. Have you ever had French fries in your car and you're driving and you're just hoping for a red light so you can eat away and then you just happen to get all green lights, right? And you're still trying to dig in where you're driving. Driving, driving doesn't distract me from French fries. I get my French fry eating, um, my French fry eating. That's one thing you can eat in the car. I'm not someone who like can eat a sandwich in the car, but French fries. But I do like to, this doesn't sound funny, but like I try to like, particularly if I'm eating something bad, I want to sit and like focus on what I'm doing so that I really enjoy the experience. So I try not to drive and eat if I can avoid it. I, I know, but I'm talking about a, a, a tough schedule. Well, I mean, my schedule, I, I got to eat on the yeah. go. And my whole thing is yeah. I can eat French fries, right? And what will happen is when I'm trying to dig in these fries, I'll end up grabbing the receipt in my hand and almost sticking it in my mouth because I'm, I mean, I mean, I get caught up sometimes. You gotta be careful. So you're not dipping it in anything. No, no, fries. no. I mean, I'll put it in ketchup okay. if, if it's in front of me, but when I'm driving, no. I, and I love McDonald's fries. Yeah. And I'll have them make them fresh. Yeah, you can't beat McDonald's fries. Wingstop fries are my very favorite, okay. but McDonald's are definitely up there. There yeah. you go, exactly. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Tequila or vodka? Vodka. If, okay, if I'm shooting, if I'm taking shots, yeah. it's clear tequila, like a Patron. There you go. Andre Berto can tell you about tequila shots and I. Okay. Um, if I'm drinking like a cocktail, it's vodka. Do you chase it with a lime, your tequila? Yes. Wow. Salt and lime. Wow, we have that in common. I'm not a big shot girl. It ha like, it's, it has to be a special situation. I'm definitely not doing it by myself. It has to be a group setting where, like, everybody's Of course, that makes it fun. Yeah, there's no fun to take a shot by yourself. No, no, then that, yeah, that, that, that that's no fun. Funny. It's like watching a funny movie by yourself. I got to enjoy it with somebody. Exactly. Yes. Yep. Now, sure. Corona or Modelo? I don't know what that is. Beer? Yes, beer. Beer? Yeah. I'm not a beer drinker. I wish that I was. <laughs> I don't like beer. I grew up in Texas. I should be a beer drinker. I don't, I've, I've never been a beer drinker and I really wish that I was because I feel like there's times you you're going and you're sitting in a bar and you don't, you don't want something as strong as a cocktail, but I, I'm not a beer person. So what's your, so what's your favorite drink you like to put together? Like you show up to a bar and what do you order? If I'm at a bar where we're drinking multiple drinks, vodka tonic with a lime. There you go. Um, if we're like out to dinner, I love a fun fruity cocktail. Not It doesn't have to be like frozen strawberry margarita, but something more fun and fruity. Um, but those are things you can't drink many of or the sugar will get you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the sugar will get you. It's like having a snow cone. Yeah. Sometimes I'll ask him for yeah. another shot. Yeah. It tastes so too sweet. Yeah, in a bar, going up to a bar, vodka tonic with a lime. There you go. Now, your favorite song. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I have a favorite song. I love um, Closer to Fine by the Indigo Girls. I'm listening to that a lot. Um, I don't have one favorite song, though. I like that song a lot, though. I've been listening to it recently, so it's on my mind. For some reason, if you were to walk into a boxing ring, make that ring walk. The crowd is going crazy. You're going crazy. What would be your walkout song? Uh, fighter by, um, I have thought about this. Fighter, who is it by? Um, I'm trying to think of who it's by. But like, it talks about being a fighter. Okay. Um, so that would be, and I have thought about this. And I, at one point, wanted to have one amateur fight. Just because I felt like, I should know what it feels like yeah. to get in the ring one time. I know that I would be terrible at it, but just to like to do like a master's three one minute rounds. Sure. Um, but I've had a few boxing coaches who have told me that I do not move my head and I don't need to fight. <laughs> so I have promised them that I won't fight, but I have thought about it. And like I would have a ring walk song for 
a master's amateur fight, but I did think about what my ring walk song would be. Well, maybe a, a charity match, amateur charity match. It would have to be like big gloves. Um, yeah, of course. And I joked at the time that, you know, I would go to go visit all these trainers, you know, go see Verge and at that time, go see Mike Stafford and, you know, go by DC and see Barry. And like, everybody said, you would be so confused. You have to, you know, obviously I have my B and B guys. Um, and that's who's last trained me. Um, but they told me, I just feel like I had access to all this knowledge and they were like, all that knowledge would screw your brain up. Like you have to, you have to stick with one teacher or you will just be confused. Historically, a fighter that, that you're not uh, working with, who's your favorite fighter? outside of who you're working with. It can be his, uh, it can be <laughs> before um, you, you started, uh, before you were involved in boxing or it can be now. It's funny. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I mean, probably Vernon Forrest. Um, it's okay. It's interesting because like I joke that I don't love boxing, like the sport. I love the people. Um, right. That's what I feel connected to. Um, so I don't sit and watch old time fights like that. Pernell Whitaker or Vernon Forrest, probably just from what I've learned about them. Um, you know, Shakur has Pernell uh, Whitaker tattooed on his leg. Oh, yeah, Pernell. Who, you know, favorite fighters. I mean, you can't beat it. But I just, I had the chance to meet Vernon before he passed, and he seemed like sp such a special person. I, I would put him up there. Yeah, he had that big uh -huh. right hand. And uh, actually, he yeah. was the first one to beat uh, Shay Mosley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Vernon, Vernon had a great career. Yeah, he came to some amateur events. Um, and I got the chance to meet him and, you know, I'm drawn to people more than, um, than the actual boxing piece of it. Um, so it's more the people that I know and got the chance to meet. Well, let's talk about the, the 147 pound division. We know who's pound for pound, uh, the best in the world now. What did you know over a lot of people that didn't expect the outcome that, that took place? How did you know? I mean, it, it's good to know because you're close to fighters, but how did you right. really know, Julie? How did you know for a fact we're going to be okay going into this fight? I it's going to come our way. I didn't know. I mean, you don't know. Um, and it's hard because, you know, I talked about knowing all these guys through amateurs. Errol was one of my Olympians who was from Dallas. So, you know, I have a relationship with Errol. Um makes it much easier when they fight people I don't know and care about. Yeah. Um, I know what Terrence is capable of theoretically. And I was asking a lot of people, you know, Shakur came to camp and was sparring with Bud. Okay, what do you think? I I, I tap into different people whose boxing minds I trust right. more than than my own. Um, I think for Terrence, it's, it's about just begging for this opportunity and finally getting this opportunity and not – and somebody terrence is somebody who rises you know and i think that i've been fortunate to be around people who rise when the moment when the moment is the biggest and it's the toughest moment that's when they rise and so i think it, it's more about just having an understanding of who terrence is as a person and as a fighter and that takes nothing away from errol who's amazing i've known him since he was a teenager um and i know he never backs down from a challenge so i knew that fight was going to happen at some point but i think it's just knowing who Terrence is as a person and just what he's made of. And I don't know what anybody who gets in the ring with him is, is going to be able to do to beat him. He's just the will, obviously the skill is there. The talent is there. He works harder than anybody. I know it's wild. He does the incline on his rest day. It's not a rest day. Most people train for the incline. That's what he does on his rest day. Wow. So, you know, and you can talk about work ethic and all of those things, but when you see it, you know, week after week, and you have a front row seat for it. Yeah. Um, he's just made of something I've never encountered before. When watching the fight, what round convinced you? What what part of the fight convinced you? Like, hey, this this is ours. He he's in his zone. He's in a different place today. When did you know um, when, when the fight the took place? The, the second after the knockdown. Um, it was funny. I was in the press section. But I knew that to get to the ring, like once the fight ended, it was going to be hard to get there fast because people were going to come. So as the rounds went on, I started moving closer to the ring. So I think I moved in the fifth. I moved in the fifth and then like closer to the ring. And then I thought it was going to end in the seventh. And then he obviously um, made it through the seventh and, and it got stopped in the ninth. But 
he just didn't have any answers no. um, for anything that Bud was doing. I think, you know, his coaches maybe knew. I don't know that anybody could have predicted that outcome. Um, but it just, you know, as much as I love Errol, it makes me very happy for Terrence because I know how hard he's worked and what he's gone through for this moment. And I've sat and had conversations with him when, you know, he's begging for a fight and nobody will give it to him. And, it, you know, it seems like those opportunities aren't going to come. And so to finally see that opportunity come and him to seize it, you know, in the way that he did was, was something really amazing. And then to be with him for his parade um, through Omaha and see 20,000 people, all walks of life, all ages, all races, um, come out and support him and just be screaming and so excited to see him. Um, you know, he deserves all of that. So it, it's really special to see him finally, finally get it. Yeah, he got his opportunity and, uh, you know, he ran with it. He knew something that uh, nobody yeah. else knew and he applied himself and he made a bold, a bold move, uh, leaving one promotion to, to another to make this happen, which leads to my next question. What do you look for in a promotion company when signing with them or agreeing with them? And how hard is the, the negotiation? That's that's one part I don't deal with. You know, my fighters do their managers and their uh, do okay. all their promotional agreements. So, you know, I can work with any any promoter, and I try to have you know build a relationship. I've worked with Evan, everybody at Top Rank, and you know, more recently, I've been working a lot with the PBC crew, um, which is it's kind of where I started more on the PBC side. You know, with Berto and those guys. Yeah. So, um, they all have different things that they bring to the table, and I think. I think it's just important for fighters to know to not fully expect your promotion your promoter to do all the promoting. They're going to promote your, they're going to promote their your fights and they're going to promote you because they obviously want you to be bigger and more well known because you're going to bring more eyes. But, you know, understanding who you are as a fighter, being on top of your social media, um being smart about your social media. You know, I do yeah. media training with all all the Olympic teams and it's become a lot of social media because, you know, particularly with the younger kids, they're just not um, presenting the image that they should sometimes um, on social. So it's understanding what your job as a fighter is to promote yourself in conjunction with what your promoter is going to do. When you go to a fighter and you talk to him and you guys both negotiate or both agree, what exactly do I don't want to use the term. What do you promise them? What what do you do for them? What do you offer them? Right. What is it exactly? Like once so, you get a fighter, what does your job consist of right. with that fighter? So the first thing that I do when I start working with a fighter, even if it's somebody that I know, um, is I sit and I do a Zoom interview with them. And I learn about their background because it's important, like I said, to tell their story. So I sit down and I do an interview with them, go back to the beginning, how they got involved in boxing, even with guys that I know, because there's always something that I don't know. So, um, and then I create a bio for them that focuses on their background, their story, whatever human interest elements um, we want to highlight. And then obviously their career boxing elements. Um, and I make sure that they approve it. So I'll write their bio and I tell them, listen, you don't have to talk about anything you don't want to. So if there's something in here, don't be shy. No, Julie, I don't want that. Um, then we create media lists for them. Um, we promote generally their their fights are the focus. So, you know, we get an idea of when their next fight is and start doing media outreach on their behalf. I help out with their social um, travel. It, it depends on, you know, sometimes I'm coming in a little bit later in their career. So like Shakur is used to me handling everything from A to Z. But if I'm coming into a team that's already existing, like what do you want me outside of the PR piece? I can do travel. I can help you with medicals. The house that Terrence wow. Crawford, his camp house in Colorado Springs, I found. Um, we joked about me being a realtor. Sometimes I feel like a travel agent. Um, a it's a little bit of everything, but it varies. It varies by um, if you wear a lot of hats, you have more job security, I found. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I try to, you know, I do a little bit of everything, particularly related to boxing and fight week, um, you know, and then I manage their fight week schedule. So you know, every day of fight week, everybody that's on their, that boxer's team gets a schedule at 9 a.m. We're going to meet here. This is where this meeting is. This is where this press conference is. Um, and then I hand them back to their coaches for whatever 
whatever training schedule it is. I don't ever like my boxers to have a surprise. We don't want something to pop up on fight week that they didn't know was coming. How fulfilling is it to you to see your fighter grow from his first interview to being nervous to, oh man, just, I mean, now he's a uh, color commentating or now he's just up there right. and can tackle any interview. How fulfilling is that for you? Knowing that you put him through the That's training my favorite and, part. and you, ex- you gave him the experience he needed. Yeah. That's my favorite part. And I think that's the thing that I miss most about the amateurs. And I get to see them grow still. You know, like I said, I just started working with Freddie Rojas as he grows on to become a world champion. You know, I will have seen so much growth. Um, I laugh. You know, I look back when Shakur was an amateur and somebody from the International Federation walked in and he walked up and he put his hand out and he said, hi, I'm Shakur. And I was like, so proud of this kid that, you know, could be in the room with grownups. And now obviously he's a two division world champion and a dad and all of these things. Um, so seeing the growth is, is my favorite part. Um, and also just understanding what these athletes know and, and don't know, because I also try to do life skills stuff where they don't, right. they don't know things, you know, it's, we don't know what we don't know. And it's always, not always, sometimes surprises me, you know, going back to Clarissa Shields when she was a 17 year old Olympian, you know, and, came to the OTC and learned all of these things. The growth from that point to not even world champion, you know, even before that, watching Andre Ward go into the Hall of Fame, you know, his Olympics were my first. So I have seen every single piece of it. And um, that's definitely my favorite part of it. And it makes it, it makes it everything, all the stress and the drama and the frustration worth it when you see, you know, them get across the finish line. Shakur didn't want to walk into a boxing gym. That kid loves boxing more than any human I've ever met. But after the Olympics, he didn't walk into a boxing gym for two months. He went to camp with Dre for Kovalev and it kind of pulled him back out. But, you know, you see those lows, but the lows make the highs so much better. If everything was, was always down those highs, that high from Terrence winning was so high because of everything that he'd, that he'd been through. It just makes you have a different perspective on it for sure. Well, like I said, he, he took the, the most of his opportunity, created that opportunity yeah. and uh, definitely the other half of, of, of greatness, uh, dared himself to be great and uh, stepped up to the plate and hit a grand slam and touched every base. Now, on your free time, there's there's the perks. There's the what's the most expensive thing you bought this year, 2023 on yourself? Oh, gosh, I'm not a big spender of things. Um to think Purse. i'm not a big purchase person so not this year i bought um my first louis vuitton bag came from andre berto as a gift oh nice gosh 13 years ago um wow i it was like i don't know if you've seen the movie sex in the city where the where jennifer hudson runs around screaming with her louis vuitton bag that's what happened um i okay. bought myself a louis vuitton bag um when I came back to Colorado, I came back to Colorado in 2011, but yeah, it's not, not a big purchase person. No, I like to travel though. I like to, um, that's, I'm more of an experience. I'm an experience over, um, item person. Okay. So I like to, I like to travel. I haven't done, you know, I get into the mountains a little bit because I'm in Denver. I can go into Breckenridge or I can go into Vail and spend, you know, I spent a few days up in Breckenridge after I got back from Terrence's fight. So that was that was kind of my present. What's on your bucket list? And what have you what's on your bucket list and you just crossed it out? That I have crossed off. Woo. I don't I'm trying to think. I mean, that fight was was huge for me. I think getting to work on the biggest fight in the world was definitely something that that I had hoped that I gotten to do. I've gotten to go to four wow. Olympics, so let, you know, let, let me let me stop you. Let, let, let me stop you right there. Say that again. The biggest fight in the world. Biggest fight in the world. Wow. Yes. Um, I got to work the biggest fight in the world. Um, and I really worked hard on being present in it and not allowing. Like I was actively working on that. Of, of yes, it's stressful and you know we're worried about things, but of being present in that. Um, You know, and it's funny, like when Shakur fought in his first title fight, I I really, it was like my next generation of like, 
I know that I have spent a lot of time. I've been in these amazing moments and I know that I have allowed stress and worry and all of these things to diminish my experience in those moments. So when Shakur fought for his first world title, of really being present in those moments. So that's something that I'm really working on. Um, I would like to go back to the Olympics. Um, next Olympics are in Paris. So wow. I'm trying to find an in if I can. That'd be nice to squeeze in that one. Yes, it would be nice. Um, Tokyo was probably the one to miss because of all of the COVID crazy. It was not, you know, Yes. I'm glad that they were able to have it and those athletes were able to go compete, but um you know, it was definitely not the typical experience. Julie, what's the toughest part about your job? I think making athletes do things at times when they would rather be resting. <laughs> um, I joke sometimes that I am a professional nag. Um, I'm the person who has to come in and, and get them to do things. And, you know, they understand that I work with professionals, so they understand that it's part of their job. But, you know, sometimes I have to accept that I'm annoying. Um, that's just part of my job. The other thing I think in my previous life, um, as an Olympic press officer was making athletes do interviews after they lost. Oh, wow. That it's is always tough. Really, difficult. Really tough. Um, you know, and at the Olympics, you come through, you come through the mix zone. So you come through a media section. That's why they got, you know, the interview with Shakur crying when he hit broadcast and then you come into the mix zone. Um, so it was always something that I hated, you know, when we would prepare and we would do media training, I let them know that that was going to happen. And, you know, they could take a minute and, you know, I would go and meet them before we kind of turn the corner. Um, but particularly on an Olympic stage where that's the biggest moment of their life after a loss is was tough. A lot of emotion. You know what? One hat that you're wearing and you didn't give yourself that title is you're a people's coach is what you are. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I try. Yeah. I try. I try to be, um, you know, in a support system and somebody that that people can lean on and that they know that they can trust and um, be honest with and, you know, be a cheerleader uh, when it's when it's necessary. OK, here's kind of a tough question, because I've seen you in action and there's times that I said hello and there's times that it's like, OK, no, she's in 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 work mode. She's moving. When are you most approachable? during fight week and and i know you're busy during fight week when is it time right. i mean do, is there a time when you say okay i finished that press conference i'm i'm, I'm gonna go have me a drink and relax right. fight week is yeah. hectic all the way around um, when are you approachable during fight week right um i would say after events are over like okay. and i don't mean after the fight is over so after the press conference is over and my athlete is gone um or after the grand arrivals and my athlete is gone um and I generally have some downtime. It's a, it's rare that I don't, you know, Spence Crawford was what it was. That's next level yeah. crazy. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to Jesus's fight next week. I know I'm going to have a little downtime. So, you know, if people see me at the hotel, um, you, as you said, you can tell when my face is in a, um, in a place where I'm like, don't talk to me. Um, but that's, it's generally just in the, in the midst of actual meet uh, sure fight week events that I'm not going to be, I'm not going to say not approachable, but you may get a short answer or I may not hear you. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and it's something that uh, yeah. myself and a lot of other media and a lot of other interesting people need to respect, especially if they can read it and see it. Uh, some people ignore it. Right. I'm not one that ignores it unless I'm, I'm going to tell you, Hey, Hey, your, your foot's on fire or something of that <laughs> nature. But no, I, I can tell when right. somebody's um, you know, when they're in work mode, I respect that. And a lot of times it's that somebody's always asking for something. So you get in a mode where if somebody stops you, you think that they're asking you for something. So that's the other piece of it. Um, it's very rare that I'm like, I don't want to say hello to somebody. Um, but sometimes you get in the mode where, yes, yeah, some everybody's pulling on you and they want something. And that makes you, it kind of makes you put a wall up in those moments of like, can I just have a minute to like, Take a breath and breathe before somebody else is asking me for something. Um, exactly. But yeah, yeah, well, I love it though. I mean, Fight Week is my. It, I love it. You know, I don't. I think that that is a part of my job that I'm the best at. I really, you know, am confident in my ability to run a Fight Week and to, you know, 
make the best use of my fighter's time and make sure that everything and and I'm a nervous wreck leading into it um because I just want everything to go right for them so over preparation is my way of dealing with with that um I joke that I'm like packed three days before because I've done everything else I can do so you know now I'm packed um it's it's just wanting everything to be right for for my athlete um and wanting everything to to run smooth. Well, you excel at the highest platform. I mean, just get this. A cut man can't really shine unless his fighters cut, unfortunately. I mean, if, if right. they just win and there's no cut, he yeah. really doesn't get to shine. Yeah. Now, if, you if, hope you don't if, need yes, him. If, he, yeah. if he suffers a, a, a cut, then he gets to shine. He gets to just close it. Now, everybody gets to know exactly what he does. So on the highest platform, that's when right. you're at your best. Is that safe to say? Yeah, I think so. And I, But I think it's because... I have done all of the work ahead of time. I've learned, I'm not gonna say I've learned all the lessons, but you know, I, they joke that nobody's better than an overthinker in an emergency because they have thought of every single thing that could possibly happen. Wow. Um, so there's there's a plan A, B, and C if if things don't go smooth. And um it's you know, it's funny because I laugh at myself, even this this last fight aside, you know, even Shakur's fight weeks. I just get so anxious going in, but it's it's just the preparation and wanting everything to go smooth. But that leads you to just be super prepared. And there's nothing that's going to happen that I'm not ready for at this point. No, exactly. And, and it's always good to be prepared and have a plan A, B, and C, just yeah. like a fighter, being able to adapt and uh, transition and wh whatever he or she needs to do inside of the ring. Now, if I ever see you in Vegas and you need anything, I don't care if it's a, hey, I need a cup of coffee and I don't got time to wait in that line, pull my coat. Let me offer my service. Thank you. And, I appreciate and just it. Just say, hey, Rich, can you do me a favor? I say, absolutely. I got you. Yes. I appreciate yeah. it. Just, just yes. know that. Well, you know what, Julie? Thank you. I appreciate your time, uh, taking time, uh, coming on the Fighter's Voice. I've been wanting to ask you and get you on for a while now, and I'm glad I had the I opportunity. That. You are my first podcast, so... Oh, really? Okay. Thank you for the, ex you are. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for the experience. Now I can, you know, I have this one under my belt and um, yeah, anytime. And I wanted to give people a feel of exactly what you do. Cause a lot, like, like I said, in top of the show, a lot of people see you around. They see you sometimes on TV. They see you moving around. Now they have an idea of exactly why you're there, what you do and who you yeah. do it for. Yes. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. Now, the platform is yours. Is there anybody you want to give a shout out to or say hello to? The platform's all yours. Um, shout out to or say hello to. No, I would just say um, tune in and watch Jesus Ramos on September 30th. Um, follow Freddie Rojas and Shakur Stevenson will be back November 16th. And then we're hoping Kenny Sims will be back um, in December. So just keep an eye out. Um, if you want to follow me, I'm at Julie R. Gold on Instagram and at JR Gold Sticker on Twitter. There you go. So, so after I follow me and feel free to come wave and say hi if you see there me. There you go. <laughs> I'm your host, Richard Ortiz of the Fighters Voice, the only voice that matters. And I'm like our guest. We're simply knocking out the competition. I want to thank our guests. Don't forget to follow our YouTube if you have not subscribed yet, www.youtube.com slash the Fighters Voice. Remember, every fighter has a voice and so do you. As always, it's a wrap. Thumbs up for Richie. Okay, fight fans, it's not goodbye, but until next week. Remember, remember, remember. It's always voiceography at its finest. So on behalf of Richard Ortiz, the special guests, and all the crew right here at the Kick-Ass Podcast, saying hasta luego, babies. And always, thanks for listening.